I can't afford to buy beef. Too expensive. It's all I used to eat is nothing but beef. Now I gotta go down to chicken because it's cheaper. Well, because uh, you can't have no beef, uh, meat to go with your meals, so you gotta cut down on uh, uh, your cooking wise. And you can't hardly go out to uh, eat and get uh, meat, so you gotta uh, do what you gotta do uh, uh, to survive. Everything's gone up, you know, price wise on the meat and stuff, it's all went up. You can't hardly afford to go out and get a little bitty burger uh, anymore. But uh, I go hunting and, and I hunt for my food, uh, deer, hogs, uh, whatever I can uh, get to my, for food. That's what I use for me uh, now. My purchasing habits have changed just for the mere fact of I'm not going to the grocery store near as often. And I have a type 1 diabetic at home, so I'm trying to send other people to the grocery store. Food choices have changed a little bit. We're trying to eat mostly vegetables and I grow a garden, so we have a garden in our home and trying to eat things off my own property if I can. I still purchase beef at the, the whatever the rate is. Um, we might slow down on it a little bit. We have cut down on our beef consumption a little um, just because we're trying to eat a little healthier. So we're eating more fish, more chicken, less pork and moderate amount of beef. My cooking habits has changed drastically, actually. We do not eat out hardly at all anymore. I mostly cook at home, and um, I'm even, even on the days that I do work, I have meals prepared already so my family can eat at home as well. So we're not eating out almost zero. I'm probably buying a little less, more chicken and fish because uh, we feel like it's healthier, um, but we still like uh, the steak and brown beef, so um, maybe just a little bit, not that much. I do a lot of takeout, we do takeout, and uh, also I'm considering signing up for a food delivery service, so um, that's the direction we're getting. When we go to the grocery store, we try to uh, just go once a week and get what we need. Because it's summer, uh, we, we grill more. Uh, my husband likes to grill the dry aged steaks that we get inside the store. So we grill more. Uh, I don't cook as much. Me personally, I haven't changed up anything. Um, it is scary though, I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, if we were to catch it, my eating habits, I still eat pretty much the same, follow the rules that they've given us. That as far as food, it is possible that we can catch it through that food that you bought or, you know, they could carry it around like that. So, I mean, we just got to be careful and abide by the rules that they've given us and just uh, do the best that we can. I got a, um, a uh, average size family, uh, two kids, a wife, and, and um, it's real hard to buy uh, like uh, beef and uh, things of those nature because they're limited and uh, most time they're, they're, uh, you, can't, you can only buy the little small pack and that's it. There are other things that, that are there's not just not on the shelves, uh, they're not being shelved and, and uh, that I'm noticing and, and then a lot of the prices have changed a lot, uh, have went up forcing us to have to use like uh, somebody that drives for Uber to, to drive us, deliver us food or something because we can't afford to, to buy it out of the store. And so in between that and the store, it's very hard to, to, uh, to get uh, exactly uh, what you need from, uh, to survive with as far as with food. And we hope that that would change. And so <laughs> I love to cook too. And so, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm definitely uh, have changed a lot of uh, the ways that, I, that I've cooked. Uh, and because of what I can cook with, I don't have very much to work with. And so we weren't able to cook with, with, uh, with, with beef. We were having to cook with uh, other, other things like uh, not even fish because fish was too high. Chicken was uh, not there because uh, 
uh, event, you know, somebody beat you to the store or they just uh, w wasn't stocking it. And so, um, but yeah, the, the, with, the, with the beef, it definitely uh, was uh, very tough when I went to the store and I, I got a little small pack of beef and it was like this. And, and I had another one, they told me I could only have one. Even when I ordered online, it was the same way. I wanted to have a barbecue on the, the fourth, and um, but I just it was just uh, I didn't want to be outside. Uh, to be honest, just that I didn't want to have uh, any other people coming around. Or too much contact. My family and I own cattle, and we take them to. about six months and um, what we have found out is that the stock shows um, that they typically have in the spring got canceled because of the pandemic it put those uh, the cattle that were being shown at the stock shows they were all been taken to slaughterhouses so then it put us six months behind getting our cattle um, slaughtered so that we have beef for our family since the pandemic we had an issue and getting cattle slaughtered, then I have to start buying more beef here at the store. So that is really how it has impacted us. Um, we're getting ready to get our calves, a couple of calves slaughtered next week. So um, it's been kind of kind of hard. I do cook a little bit more. We cook, I cook almost every meal at home and I have before the pandemic, but now I cook even more because we don't eat out at all. So I cook out and barbecue almost every night and um, looking for a lot of different re more recipes probably I, I would say um, because we just don't feel comfortable going out to eat because of the pandemic. I find myself looking a little more at pricing, um, the taking advantage of sales especially on briskets. We like to smoke uh, meats and uh, that, that's been important to me to take advantage of, of sales. Um, I did notice when the prices started climbing, uh, maybe waited till the sales happened before I bought beef. We had a, we had a stockpile of, of beef already. We buy uh, um, uh, large quantities, usually from United, um, and we have been pursuing purchasing quarters uh, and finishing them ourselves since, since the prices went so high. We've definitely cooked more since it started um, because of uh, restaurants not being open or not being able to host my whole family. We have five, including myself. Um, we've found ourselves cooking a lot more at home, uh, a lot more grilling out. Um, so the price of beef has, has been important to us because we've bought more to eat at home. Nothing's really changed for me. Stock up a little bit more, buying a little bit more in bulk, I would say. We, we eat beef all the time anyway, so nothing's changed for me and my family. We love Texas beef today, tomorrow, and forever. I mean, it's getting so ridiculous to where you we can just afford a pack of meat. Like, you know, it's everything's getting just so high, so expensive. People are getting rude. People are jumping you because you don't have your mask, you don't have your hand sanitized. My little boy got jumped yesterday by an old lady. Where is your mask? I mean, we're trying out here to, you know, to survive in this world. I mean, I guess meat. it's I guess it's a good thing in some ways because we're not eating so much fatty foods. We, we're turning to our pastas, our veggies, our fruits. So, I mean, I, I guess just keeping your mask on, washing your hands, and, and listen. Not a big issue. Yeah, yeah, listen. You know, just beef listen to, to me. you know, what the government or whoever's saying it. You know, just listen. Put your mask on, hand sanitize, wash, wash, wash. You know, that's all we gotta do, and pray about it. You know, the Lord will see that we're praying, listening, and this might go anytime if we cook a lot. Yeah, you know, we, we can just barely yeah. afford a pack. A pack of meat is like eleven dollars. It's but just well, for a little pack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I cook half of what I used to cook and it makes it just enough. So I guess it's kind of saving us. I mean, it's, it's weird to say, but the virus isn't so bad to me because it's showing us how to save, how to stay in, you mm -hmm. know, and of course your 
your, your protocols as far as washing hands and, you know, being clean. I mean, a human, you're supposed to do that already anyways, mm -hmm. but it just enforces people that weren't doing it before. It's been really hard to find ground beef a lot of times, uh, top rounds, things like that. So I've been buying more chicken and more pork uh, just because it's hard to find and when you can find it, you buy what you can. Um, when I could, I just bought it anyway because, you know, my kids like spaghetti and stuff like that. But uh, I usually kind of just didn't buy it. It was just too much. We've been trying to figure out, you know, different recipes to try. We are eating a lot of spaghetti. <laughs> uh, things have been bought up pretty much everywhere. So you either have to buy more expensive or just do what you can. Have definitely been uh, making a lot of bulk dinners so we can have lots of leftovers. We love to grill. I got some brats in there right now to do on the grill. Um, hamburgers have been a little harder, but we do what we can. Uh, I try to go about once a week and just get what I can, and that's pretty much it. I guess it'd be we're buying less of beef. For everything else, we try to buy online. But for beef, uh, we prefer not to come to the store as much. So it's, uh, it's been reduced quite quite a bit. Luckily, I found out about the uh, coronavirus um, at my job because I was working for a hotel company. And so I was able to become aware of it pretty early on. And I went to uh, the supermarket and I bought really a lot of steaks and filled up my freezer only, pretty much only with steak um, because I don't know, I figured I would enjoy eating steak if I had to defrost it over time, kind of over other things. And, you know, so in that regard, I was able to buy that meat without having the price be impacted like it has been now. Because now I'm less likely to buy it because it's so much more expensive. I used to go out to eat maybe a couple of times a week. And now I have cooked every meal that my family has eaten since March 17th. Um, my husband and he even comes home every day for lunch so it's another added meal that I'm serving at the kitchen table. The beef qual quantity has been uh, very scarce more recently than in my lifetime. Uh, it's been I've had to find new meat to eat such as ground turkey and pork and just kind of got out of the beef a little bit. We normally eat beef every night or every other night, but that kind of had to change since the corona. When we first started, uh, we were cooking more, but then we, you know, had to, we got tired of cooking at home and started going out to eat more and started relying on the restaurants instead of home-cooked meals. Uh, we actually had a barbecue for the 4th of July. Um, mainly ribs, steaks, sausage. Yeah, so barbecue's a regular thing in my family. It's been hard to adjust to, but not too hard, not too challenging. The mass thing is, it's easy. It's the heat and the mass that make it, that make it tough. But other than that, it's been a, it's been a nice summer. I haven't been uh, able to buy that much more meat. I, lo I love to grill. I love to actually cook. With my mom, she, she actually cooks more because um, she's able to uh, get more beef. So she, she likes to cook hamburger, helper, and meatloaf, all that. So there, there's actually a, uh, a quite a bit of stuff that she actually gets. With the restrictions going up, we had to cut down on meat. We diverted to, you know, um, mashed potatoes and, you know, canned food and, you know, like spam and uh, as well as the uh, um, lunch meat. So we're more, went towards the fast food unhealthy route. Well, if I'm being honest, like I try not to go to the store anymore just because like, I don't want to risk getting anything. So I've, been, I've resorted to fast foods and you know, simply things. Uh, they put like, restrictions on how much you can get. And it, I mean, I go to like fried burritos or something instead, instead of home cooked meals. I am cooking way less. I, if anything, I just try to stop at a McDonald's or something and give me something real quick because I, don't, I really don't want to take the time to walk in a store and possibly catch something. Well, we kind of just try to ration it out. Like, I have a big family. There's like five of us living in the house. So we just try to, try to make sure it lasts us because we don't know when they're going to shut things down again. We don't know when they're going to really limit to where we only get so much per person. 
meat prices, they're like sky high, too much plus the tax. I mean, you're better off just going to the farm yourself and getting the cow and getting the meat itself. Like, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I eat a lot more chicken and pork, and I don't eat as much as red beef anymore, red meat. I mean, we're having a party tonight, so we'll see how that goes. Are we barbecuing stuff? Chicken. chicken. Yeah, barbecue chicken. Yeah, probably pork ribs too. I'm very cautious about what we buy now. You just gotta be careful what you buy now because everything could be contaminated one way or another. I mean, it is crazy. Out here, since I'm from Chicago, I'm just visiting family, so it's like a whole different perspective. Like, I've never seen the store this packed because I'm used to, like, up there, we're still in, like, we're like in phase four, because you know it's different phases. It's just, it's crazy. Yeah, culture shock. It's been a good minute since I've been down here. My name is Trey Strange. I'm the owner of the Silver Bullet Sports Bar and Grill, Lubbock, Texas. I spent 30 years in the corporate world uh, working for somebody else. Uh, toward the end, I was putting in very long days, uh, not getting much reward from it. Uh, I wanted to build something that, uh, that I can benefit from the time and effort that I put into it. Uh, and also have, create something I can pass on to my family uh, down the road. As a small business owner, I actually purchased the Silver Bullet on uh, March 9th. It was open for 11 days and was forced to shut down for 13 weeks uh, for the pandemic. It's a sports bar, so we were one of the last to open. Basically, I took that time to, uh, to put my fingerprints on this place. I uh, uh, basically rebuilt, remodeled this place from the inside out uh, and built it to the image that, uh, that I wanted to carry forward for the next uh, 20 or 30 years. Between my customers and the staff, I have to say that was the reason I actually purchased uh, this place. It's very successful. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to take it over the top, but uh, the customer base itself is just, uh, uh, they're loyal, they're good. Uh, I mean, just, just good down-to-earth people. The bills did not stop, that is true. Um, during that uh, 11 to 12 weeks I was shut down, I maintained payroll the entire time. Uh, had to pay for the, uh, the remodel. I had working capital set aside to survive slow times. Uh, did not expect to be shut down for as long as we were, but uh, yeah, rent, rent, utilities, those bills were due. Insurance, uh, those bills have to be maintained. Beef prices, chicken prices are elevated. Bacon has gone up. I have a great staff, um, and that's why it was important to me to keep the staff together during the shutdown. Um, actually, in the first three weeks of the shutdown, as I was depleting all of our food, uh, I had a family dinner. We called it a family dinner where I invited all my staff in every night with their families to, to eat. And we just, we would cook, our cooks would cook and uh, we'd have a meal and we were able to do that for almost three weeks uh, into the pandemic, thinking that it was gonna be ending soon, not realizing it was gone for 11 or 12 weeks. I kept the payroll going on my own and right about the time I was running out of money, uh, the payroll protection loan kicked in and, and saved the day. So uh, we were able to maintain 100% of our staff plus added three to actually four more people uh, which I call the post-COVID compliance. Um, we've added people to basically go out there and clean the tables immediately when somebody leaves, disinfect them. Uh, we disinfect our bathrooms every two hours. We actually have to have a doorman uh, on our busier nights to make sure that we don't get over capacity, uh, which is difficult. When we first opened, our capacity was 30 people. Uh, it's, it was hard on me to open my doors and to see more people standing in line outside than I was able to allow, allow in inside. So my payroll has basically tripled on my busier nights. The most frustrating part about this uh, pandemic is the, the limit one per customer. Um, I'm a small business. Uh, I don't have enough to support uh, uh, really a food truck coming in, um, you know, a couple times a week. So I have to do shopping myself or I, I send you know, my cooks out to do some of the shopping. Uh, we hit multiple stores and unfortunately we're doing that limit per one, you know, one per customer when it comes to ground beef, when it comes to paper products, cleaning products, uh, things that we actually need, um, we're limited on. So we have to make multiple trips to stores to make sure we, have, we, we can stay in stock. Beef is our number one selling item, uh, whether it's hamburgers or taco meat or fried burritos, uh, basically across the board, taco salads, um, it's, it's our number one item outside of our uh, chicken breasts that we use for everything else. The price of beef has gone up significantly. Um, I've partnered with another restaurant here. In fact, every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, uh, I buy a couple of briskets he prepares for me. And uh, we do either chopped or sliced brisket wraps, uh, sandwiches, and uh, it's, it's, it's pretty pricey. Um, I don't want to charge uh, $8 or $9 or $10 for a brisket wrap, but unfortunately that's what we're forced to do. Um, and he's only given it to me at a, at a small percentage over his cost because he's already smoking the briskets. I'm just taking some of his overflow. 
He's doing all the work, he's trimming it out, it's ready to go. It's almost cost prohibitive to do this, but I'm providing a service to my customers that I want to make sure they have the best uh, when they're, you know, the best experience when they're when they're at my facility. I'm absorbing the hit. Um, my goal is to be the best dive bar in Texas, uh, West Texas definitely, but uh, you, you have to have uh, uh, good quality food uh, at, at, a, at affordable prices. Um, it's hard to sell a $12 cheeseburger, and, I'm, and it may be worth it, but in order for us to be a good dive bar, you got to have the affordable food to go with the, to go with the experience. And I'm not raising my prices. I'm just proud to, to be the owner of the Silver Bullet. I'm proud of my staff. Um, uh, I love my customer base, and uh, I look forward to serving the community uh, for years to come. Derek Webb, I'm the operations manager for this location. Um, grew up eating it in Brady, where my great grandparents retired, and uh, from there on, we uh, got to a point after college and some of our jobs, and we just wanted something different to do, and ended up buying the one in Brady, and ended up going to Midland for strictly catering, turned it into a restaurant, and then the true saying of not what you know, it's who you know, got us into this location. We've been blessed with our fourth one in Fredericksburg. It's a lot of heart and soul. I mean, it's blood, sweat, and tears to make sure that the meat quality stays the same. Everything is being cooked right and uh, coming off right. Uh, make sure that things aren't being overcooked and whatnot. Uh, it's definitely hard with the meat prices the way they are. We got customers that don't love the high prices, but at the same time, it's what we got to do to keep going. Uh, as far as customers, everybody seems, you know, real happy with everything. Uh, employees, they, it's a revolving door. They come and go. So it's definitely hard to keep all the good ones that you know have, you know, got you going to where you are now. What's even harder is, you know, trying to maintain and uh, keep them happy with prices going the way they are and how we're having to fluctuate everything. We lost 90% of our business once this hit. Since then, it's kind of destroyed us a little bit and caused everything to go sky high when it shouldn't and caused plants to shut down when they shouldn't. And, but it is what it is. So we're just making the best of every day that we're open. It makes a lot of customers upset, makes them angry that, you know, we have to raise our prices. A lot of people are understanding, but you got the ones that go on a budget and when they eat out, they only plan on a certain amount. And so that kind of makes them upset that, you know, they have to spend a little more. And I let them know it's more than just us. It's affected the whole economy. Just getting proper help that is willing to work. A lot of people have gotten to the point where they're happy with unemployment and they're being too lazy and don't want to work. And my society, you grow up working. And, you know, if you don't work, you don't have a car, you don't have a house, you, you know, everything that we have, we're just grateful for. And for the ones that uh, get it automatically, it's not fair to the ones that are working hard for it. Luckily, a lot of like the ribs and uh, the pork with the ribs since that's the only thing we have. And the turkey, that hadn't fluctuated too much. It's more of the brisket that has hurt us the most. Again, that's just part of, you know, all these meat companies that have been shutting down and uh, not producing when they need to be. And so that's what has affected us the worst out of all this with the prices. And it just, it hurts us to know that, you know, people are being greedy because of how things are changing it's not our fault and they need to understand that you know the whole economy is hurting from it and not just us my name is renee valdez um, better known as renee richeza and this is my business uh, i'm the owner here at richeza's philly cheesesteaks and uh and this is my daughter desiree valdez to be honest with you i never thought that i would ever have a restaurant um, the reason that I did this initially was because uh, we're from Philadelphia and I was looking for a good Philly cheesesteak and I couldn't find one. So I jokingly said to my husband back in 2009 that I 
I should open a Philly cheesesteak business. I want people to be able to enjoy, you know, a good Philly cheesesteak on this side of the country because they probably most people have not had an authentic, real Philly cheesesteak. So they've had, you know, other places, and but they really don't know what to compare it to if they haven't had someone who actually knows how to make the cheesesteak. In March of 2020, we decided to do our restaurant and it was during the COVID-19 crisis, unfortunately. And uh, we've just been trying to, you know, stay afloat and things are looking up. We're doing pretty good for the economy and the way things are right now. Because of the meat being so high at this point in time, what we've noticed a, a really big influx in uh, how the cost has changed the game a lot for us. Uh, we have a little bit of a hard time keeping up with um, the high cost because most of the things that we sell are made with meat. Ground beef, our steak meat, our roast pork, so everything has skyrocketed. The biggest increase is the ground beef. Luckily for us with the ground beef, um, it's not our biggest seller, so we try to scale back a little bit on buying large quantities of it and we kind of monitor throughout the week um, how much we're going to need uh, based on the demand. And so um, at this point in time, if we run out, we just tell our customers, I'm sorry, but we're out of meat right now, uh, out of meatballs and, you know, the things that we use with the ground beef, such as our hamburger patties and meatball sandwiches. Uh, so once we're out, we're out, and we try not to overspend because, you know, we, we're trying to conserve um, due to the COVID situation and just trying to, you know, scale upward. And we went up just a dollar on our sandwiches, and I don't want to have to increase it anymore um, because people will find other places, you know, to eat uh, if they feel like, you know, it's just too expensive. So we're just trying to maintain really the way it is right now. Things were starting to look up with the uh, occupancy. Um, we started at zero, then we moved to 50. Now we're at 75, but uh, from my understanding, what we're hearing is that the COVID cases are rising again. So people may be reluctant to come back out so we could see a resurge in, you know, people not wanting to eat out again and staying out of public places. Um, so it's possible that we can, you know, start really being affected by that. We're fortunate because people are still coming out and they're still buying and they're finding other ways to deal with the crisis. Um, they'll either get, you know, delivery or takeout or curbside. Um, and we're starting to see that people are wanting to dine in. So we're just hoping that it stays that way. We don't have a private delivery driver, and due to the time that we opened, uh, we were going to hire employees, but now we're kind of just waiting on that until things, you know, start to move forward. Um, right now, I'm depending on my family. So I have my daughter working with me, and I have another daughter that will help out, you know, if we need her. I love my mom, and I'm super proud of her. Her ambition is very inspiring to me and the fact that she worked and did so much to build this restaurant, I'm just very proud of her. A lot of times she could do a lot of things on her own because she's very strong and independent. If she needs my help, then I'll come up and I'll take orders and help her with cooking and cleaning. Well, right now it's kind of like hard, but I believe that because like the word is kind of spreading around, you know, that we're open and we do have an establishment, it's going to be easier once the pandemic gets lifted off. Having a presence on social media did help with the restaurant. Raymond Martinez, I've always worked in food and uh, I started when I was 18. We started in 2005 and we closed and then we started up again about three years ago. Just because we were doing other stuff and uh, my mom passed away and stuff, so we decided to open back up. I grew up here in this town, my brother did too. My dad was actually born in town. Morton is our hometown. 
And growing up as a kid, I always thought, man, I'm going to move away and go to the big city. Tried that for a while, decided, you know what, Morton's the place to be. And it's a pretty good little town to do business in, to raise your family, and just all the way around a good town. So not too much crime, and then everybody knows you. <laughs> and we've had little kids that will, their parents will call us and be like, hey, are y'all open? I'm like, yes, come on in, why? Well, we're in level land. Tell us when you get to Whiteface, <laughs> and we'll start making it for you. That way it's not cold, it's warm. And this pandemic's been a little bit hard on everybody, especially like the small town with getting supplies, with trying to keep costs in control and not go crazy and just wind up going bankrupt like so many little businesses have this year. We've had to adjust our hours to like 820 so we can have enough supplies for the next day and so on until we go and get supplies. And that's how we've been keeping our costs down, is just doing stuff like that, trying to actually go to the store and look at the tomatoes, make sure they're not rotten, not overripe, just right. Same thing with the lettuce, the cheese. We're cleaning twice as much as we were. We're washing our hands. We, We've even started sanitizing some of the money because of just this virus going around. We don't want to catch it, and we sure don't want to pass it on to anyone else. So we've been really cleaning, sweeping, mopping, on top of what every, everything else we have to. It's where we live. It's where we eat also. And if someone gets sick, then that's not very good. We wouldn't have done our job. I mean, we shop around. We do like you do. We go to the store. If it's too high there, we go to another store. And we just keep going. And we look at the, the distributors. How much is your meat? You know, because it was averaging about one nineteen a pound. It went up to almost $4 a pound. So we've been fighting with having to raise prices because I could give you a cheap burger, but it's not going to be what you've come to expect. All our burgers are over a third of a pound. So you're getting a lot of meat, but in the same sense, we had to keep it in a pretty good price range. You ask some of the farmers around and they're like, we're not making any money. And it's like, okay, well, what's going on? Because I'm paying almost four bucks a pound and you're telling me you're getting like 16 cents a pound. It's like someone between you and us is making a lot of money. And it sure ain't you. And it ain't me. Because I'm fighting to keep everything within a reasonable price. We have some family that own cows and they're like, I can't sell them. This week, because I guess the holiday or whatever is going on, they've had it pretty good price. It's like the brisket. We don't make brisket, but every once in a while, we buy it and we make it and we sell it. Well, we're looking at the prices and oh my God, a little brisket like this, it's $58. There's no money to be made on it. Not even my time cooking it, it would, you know, it's a, it's a waste. Then you look at the big ones and they're $85. You know, and I don't know if you know um, the shack or whatever in Lubbock, it was a barbecue place. They had to close down. They're like, there's no money in it. I'd have to charge you like almost $100 to make any kind of money on it. And that's why we always have a lot of new items because we're trying to try not to, you know, focus on just one thing because we don't want to be, like I said, that restaurant. They had to go out. They couldn't afford to, to buy the product. So we, we switch like from chicken or pork and just try to keep it to where at least you have some kind of meat going. But we've been lucky here lately. Sometimes we go to four or five different stores. Sometimes we call two or three different distributors and be like, hey, how much is your meat? And, you know, sometimes they give you a good price, and then sometimes they're like, it's crazy. It's $40 for a 10-pound roll. 
Like, I can't do that. Like, that's what we got it at today. Like they say, the ad, someone is going to have to pay for it. And it's usually the customer or the, you know, the owner or somebody. Eggs used to be 99 cents. Man, there for a while, they were four bucks a dozen. <laughs> it's like, okay, did this chicken do something different or what, you know? And, I mean, I can see. It's like with them saying they had to throw all those potatoes away. Sometimes we can't find the regular fry. We have to either get a crinkle cut or something else. Or tater tots. And even sometimes we've gone in there empty. They're like, we sold out. We don't have any. So I'm like, okay, well, we'll go to chips. Maybe something. And then there for a while, we couldn't get ice cream. Because... Everybody went from the big tubs of ice cream to little bitty ones. But the same price as the big one. That really hurt because when the meat was at a good price, you'd show up and they're like, just two. Well, that works if you live at home. So, like me, I would go, I'd hit one store. I'd hit, send my son to another store just so we would have enough to get get by is what we were doing so it, it hurt us but like I said we found a way to be able to get what we needed and there were some days that by five o'clock we had run out it, it was it was a lot a lot of stress because you could call them and they might have it when you called them but when you get there <laughs> they're out like sorry we had we had to sell it we couldn't keep it which I understand them too. They had to make money, so. But yeah, it was a, it was a real pain. It's like the toilet paper thing. I never understood that. If they wouldn't have made a big deal, people would have just kept on buying toilet paper their normal self. But they told everybody, "You better get toilet paper." <laughs> this store ran out, so then they hit the baby wipes. And well, my daughter just had a baby, not too long ago. And it's like, oh, geez, now what, you know? So we found some, thank goodness. But, you know, it's just one of those, I think they overdid it. Had they not told anybody, you would have just gone to the store. Oh, okay, they're out. I'll just go to another one. Paper towel, same thing. Only one roll or one package. So, But, yeah, it did affect us, too, with what we could sell, with what we had on hand. Then it was like, do we want to sell it all today because we might not have any tomorrow so we had to adjust our hours we started closing on tuesday thursday and sunday so it would give us another whole day to maybe go look for stuff yeah and then the sahara desert didn't help all that dust <laughs> my name is mike metzler i own this operation i would consider myself a stalker uh, operation and a, a preconditioned cattle for the feedlot that I retain ownership in. It's had a very significant impact. It's crashed the market. It's been hard to sell beef and cattle and prices were at all-time lows for in recent history and, and um, so basically just a drop in prices. I hadn't been able to get cattle sold when I needed to um, so basically I'm losing money on everything right now. February, March, in there is when it really started hurting me. I don't know anybody that's not suffered from this virus pandemic uh, at all. Whether you're feeding cattle in the feedlot or pasturing cattle or, or cow-calf, um, yeah, everybody's hurting. On average, how much are you, uh, how much are you losing per head? Uh, it varies. Um, um, some of them, it's just been forty or fifty bucks. Some of them, it's been three or four hundred bucks a head. So that adds up pretty quickly. First thing I did, and what a lot of people are doing or did, was just slow down. Uh, check check your operation, or I'm not buying the volume of stalkers I had been buying. Of course, I, I'm paying a lot less for them. And the feeder cattle I buy, I'm buying a lot less. And just 
glad to get stuff sold. I've got stuff in the feedlot, just glad when it sells, even at a loss, just because they're getting too big. Um, and then they become unmarketable. So just lucky to get them sold at all. Packers can only handle cattle of a certain size. Once they get too big, they don't want them. And when there's a glut in the market, they get to pick whichever cattle they want. And they'll look over the less, the ones that have gotten too big. I mean, eventually we've gotten them sold just at r real low prices. You know, the Packers got, there was a, is a backlog, kind of a log jam, whenever uh, the packing plant employees started getting sick, they had to close, close the plants and reduce the volume of the amount of cattle they were harvesting. And it's just a backlog in the feedlot. Feedlot couldn't get them sold, so feedlot cattle kept getting bigger and bigger, and feedlots were getting full. And, and people that sent them to the feedlots couldn't, there wasn't room in the feedlots, they had to hold them longer. So it's just a backlog on down the chain all the way back to the cow-calf man. Challenges are always to get your cattle sold timely and at the right price. So, um, you know, when the market's flooded and nobody wants cattle, everybody's afraid of what's going to happen and nobody knew how bad the pandemic was. You know, exports were going down, uh, everything. So getting them sold went from a normal problem to a big problem. And then, you know, anybody manages their finances in any business. And when, you know, your equity drops tremendously, it's a challenge, you bet. And uh, there's a limited number of packing plants, and they're big. And uh, so they can exercise a lot of control on the market. And so when, when this first hit, you know, they, the pandemic hit, they really seemed to take advantage of it. And... Um, but the administration, the Trump administration, seemed to react really well in keeping the Packers um, somewhat in line. And um, that helped out. Um, I mean, like the, the Packers felt pressure from the administration to be fair because the meat prices had soared to record highs because the consumers wanted beef, but yet the price of fed cattle that the Packers were buying was dropping precipitously. And um, the Packers at that, for that period were making tremendous amounts of money per head. And they did feel a little pressure from the administration to, to rein that in. So that helped us a little bit. As far as inputs like the commodities, um, hay hadn't really been affected that I've seen. I produce a lot of my own hay. Um, Corn, it hadn't really spiked. You know, corn, that's what, you know, the main commodity in feeding cattle. And, um, you know, it's had reasonable fluctuations. Um, of course, a dip in corn helps a cattle feeder, whereas it hurts a corn producer. But there hadn't been tremendous fluctuations in that market. You know, other inputs um, haven't really been affected. I recognize that, that restaurants make up a huge part of the demand for beef, so that was real concerning. Um, I did not expect the consumer at the grocery store to empty the shelves, which, which helped us, or particularly the, the packer cow market more than the fed cattle market. But um, yeah, I, I was worried about the restaurant shutting down. I'm almost surprised the market hadn't gone down worse than it has. But yeah, it's gone down significantly. I mean, we've, we've lost a lot of money. Industry-wide, I don't know how many billions of dollars it'd be, but a bunch of money. I'm just happy being out here by myself, uh, uh, doing what I do, so eat more beef. That's my only message, eat more beef. Well, I'm the owner of Lubbock Stockyards. I'm Tony Mann. Been here for 35 years. I was just doing odd jobs around, and a, and a man approached me to be a partner with him at the sale barn and that's been 30 something years ago and just kind of got into it and been here ever since. We're a small business and my wife and my son and I, we run it. We do the best we can and try to be personal with everybody, meet everybody and do the best we can and sometimes we get it done, sometimes we don't. The market went down pretty hard and it stayed down. It's trying to come back but it's still down and the numbers are not good either.
We're just not running a lot of cattle like we ought to, but they're just not out there. You know, people are not buying and people got to sell when they get ready, they got to sell them. And so uh, it just, you know, they're not wanting to buy anything because one thing is dry. We hadn't had very much rain. It's, we've had spotted rains, but we hadn't had a lot, you know, and uh, that's one thing that's not helping. But people are just not, I don't say that they're, they're scared, but they're just being real cautious with their money. And so therefore they're not, they're not coming in here and buying a lot of stuff. We work on numbers. The more numbers and the better price, the more money we get. And uh, when you start taking the numbers down and the price, you know, it affects everything, especially our bottom line. The feed yard boys, when they get some ready, they got to sell them. And the packers have got you. And I mean, I've always said that. You've got one guy coming to your yard and dictating the price of cattle. And, uh, and you've either got to take it or you don't take it. And the bad thing about it is if you don't take it now, next week they're probably going to be cheaper. And the packers can just kill so many. And that's all they can kill. And the feed yards just keep getting more and more buildup of cattle. And, uh, and it's affecting it. The producer uh, is losing. And, you know, we're kind of at the short end of the deal because we're selling, we're selling to the feed yard boys. And then they're selling to the packers. So it's not just, it, it's affecting us real hard because these guys that were making 50 or 75 or $100 a head are now losing two or three, four hundred dollars a head, while the Packers are making six or seven hundred dollars a head. And then, you know, I talked to a man not long ago. He worked it in the cold storage business, and he said they were lipping full. They the cold storage deal was full, and that's coming from the Packers, you know, and going to the grocery stores or the restaurants. And of course, the restaurants and and everybody's they're not running now, so we're eating at home like they want you to do, and it's affecting all the businesses, mainly the restaurants. We're kind of a middleman, but it affects us just like it did the guys in the feed yard because the price is cheaper on everything, 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 and then when you go to the packers, well, they're making a killing. So we're, I guess you'd call we're a, we're a necessary business because we're part of the food chain. And so we never did have to shut down at all. And we just kept it going. It just, we had to restrict the number of people that come to the sale and still are supposed to. And of course, you're supposed to wear a mask and wash your hands and all that. And, and of course, we had been getting big numbers of people coming to the sale. We were getting 40, 50 people every week, and which is all right. And of course, what's happening a lot is this where they forward contract them. Like you put them in the yard today and you look at the board and they're bringing a dollar ten. Well, you go ahead and contract them for six months out. Most, a lot of people, they, they don't contract them. They just, like when they get ready, they say, I want the market for them. And if it's a dollar ten or fifteen or twenty or whatever, that's what they want to do. But I think the forward contracting has hurt a bunch. You know, where, there, there's not that many cattle selling live like there used to be. Used to, they sold them all live. And you had two or three packers bid on them, but you don't have that anymore. I mean, we just got to keep plugging along and, and just keep doing what we do, except maybe do it a little bit better. I mean, and you just got to do a better job of buying and a better job of selling and fight the big guys, I guess. There's the... National Cattlemen's Association and the Southwest Cattle Raiders Association. And we put money in every head we sell to go to the meat board to try to sell our meat better, sell our cattle better. But I don't think they're doing us any good because there's so many of us that are just independent and we're just trying to get along. And we're not like in a union or something like that where we've got a lot of help to help us get more money. You just kind of do it on your own. And that's kind of the backbone of the cattle business, you know, that everybody is independent because we don't want the government telling us what to do. We do what we want, and that's what we want to do in agriculture. And, and maybe that's part of our problem because we don't 
we don't have a union or a co-op or something to tell the packers or the government we want a dollar fifty for our for our meat. I mean, we just we just take what we get, and but we want we want it to be fair, which isn't happening right now, and I, I don't guess that's going to happen because there's too many people in the deal. You start out with just little guy at the sale barn and then you go to the feed yard and they get a little bit bigger and then you go to the packer and then you go to the distribution deal where they distribute the meat and then you go to the grocery store well you know everybody's making a little bit a little bit a little bit but some of them are making a lot we're just a sale barn you know and we got some good guys that come and buy cattle we always need more buyers and always need more sellers but you just kind of have to take what you can get, you know. Like today, I had two guys out that had never got back from the fourths, and that hurt the market a little bit. There's just not as many players in the market as there used to be. We used to have 20 or 30 buyers sitting here, 10, 15 anyway. But you got one guy that's buying one class of cattle and another guy buying another class of cattle, and instead of three or four guys fighting over this one class. And, of course, dr the dry weather's got a lot to do with it because there's not any place to go with them. And we've been getting some sporadic rains, but it's not enough to do any good, you know. It just seems like it falls on the same place all the time, the rain, and uh, it's not getting around to everybody, which it needs to. But, you know, that's part of life, you know.